I bet she does. I bet she does. No, I mean, no, I mean, that's no, not. I'm sorry, I didn't, didn't quite follow you. Oh, follow me, follow me. I like that. That's good. <laughs> a nod's as good as a wink to a blind bat. Hey, hey. Lotta, you turn Lotta, still, Lotta. selling, selling. Very good, very good. Oh, wicked, wicked. You're wicked, eh? No, I mean, no, I mean, that's not. No, I mean, that's not. That's not. Nudge, nudge. Hallo zusammen, nudge, Mats Panko und ich Panko and werden Ihnen Nudging, das Nudging näher bringen und going to besser als Erik Eidel von den Monty Pythons kann man nicht vormachen, was Nudging do it ist, die kleinen Anstöße, die uns Python. in eine Richtung bringen sollen. The little nudges that are supposed to take us into a direction which we don't know what there is supposed to be. And if it's the politics doing it and not Eric Eidel, we don't like it, it's annoying to us and this is how the discussion is running these days. But saying that nudging is a nuisance is quite commonplace. We want to turn this around and show you how nudging can have positive effects and establish a new design paradigm. You all aren't as rational as you would think you are, and that's why we have to outsource thinking into items, not only into smart items, but also into dumb analog items, like this hotel key. This hotel key thinks along for you. It doesn't want to leave the hotel. It's so bulky that it is not comfortable to carry it in your pocket. And so it has been, so it has received a kind of homesickness by this bulky handle, showing it, showing that it wants to be stay home in the hotel. Nudging in general is quite an old cultural technique by which we as gods of prothesis, as lacking beings, have always helped ourselves. We have always tried to trick ourselves in our imperfection by, for example, making a knot to a handkerchief to remind us. Such a knot in the handkerchief has been featured in culture quite often. There is King Peter, in, who has this knot in his handkerchief to remind himself to think of his people at least once a day. Politics has always wanted to influence people's behavior, and these are the tools available to them. Sweet bread and enlightenment. We can't just sanction everything with restrictions and let people end up in jail if they behave wrongly. So, what we want to rely on is enlightenment. Kant's good old enlightenment, which in the last 30 years has translated into campaigns to inform the populace through federal agencies to tell the populace how to behave. For example, you put large signs beside the highways to distract you from traffic, and we look at it and just guess what does the sign want to tell us and drive against the next tree. There is such a lot of creativity and typography flow flowing into these adverts. Now this is a little more sophisticated with Colin Fernandez. 
speeders are this sexy, which will grabs all men by the balls and tries to keep them from speeding. There's another field since AIDS arrived on plane. The aim of this campaign is to sensitize the populace for the risks of speeding because each one of us has a lot to lose when you're risking your lives in traffic. Thank you for that. Now we're on to AIDS, to adverts for condoms. These are a number of adverts, quite conservative, to promote the use of condoms with latex with her husband, and I would assume that not one single condom more has been used due to these adverts. This is quite well meant, well intended, but not done well. Even more so on the topic of drugs. Interestingly, after this campaign, quit the shit against consume of hashish did not drop the use of drugs. Stamps are also a good way to pick up people, but well, I would think that this psychedelic motive would rather encourage people to throw in an LSD trip and just give it a try. And those are the well-known paradox effects that public information can have. And in the end, all campaigns to inform the public by the state end up in campaigns that are Counterproductive at least, all cigarette packets are now covered in these adverts telling people that smoking is deadly, harmful, dangerous. And a study at the University of Tel Aviv has shown people that these adverts are effective for about a week and then smoking actually increases even over the control group. It somehow reminds of the psychologist from the first Madman series coming into an agency and saying, well, there's Freud's Thanatos need to destroy oneself, so let's work with that, let's implement that. The state has been doing nudging forever, with little nudges, quite literally, from below, three speed pumps. This is real road design, which has been around for a lot of time. But well, engineers are quite inventive as well. Daimler has invented the so-called flying carpet system which allows drivers to just race over these speed bumps at speed 140 or whatever, just recognize them and float over them. And there's a competition between hunter and prey, if you will. But what does nudging do? Well, in Philadelphia, these nice optical illusions have been painted on the street. They are not even elevated about the, above the road. But they work quite well. The average speed on this road has been reduced from 38 to 23 miles per hour, reducing deaths and traffic, which is quite effective. But what's funny, these virtual nudges are quite a lot more effective than the physical nudges, physical speed bumps. This is nudging as psychology. And everything we know from cognitive and behavioral psychology we can use to implement things which actually work. And this easy thought has been used by Kess Sunstein and Robert Thaler. In the book Nudge, Thaler is a behavioral psychologist in Harvard, and both of these are counselors to Obama and to Cameron. There are nudging units in Scandinavia as well, and it works, especially in the UK. 
even the left-leaning liberal guardian has found that even if not a lot of things work under Cameron, the nudging unit does. This could not escape the attention of German Federal Chancellor Angela Merkel, who has since been looking for behavioral researchers and across the political spectrum all newspapers showed an allergic reaction knee-jerk knee -jerk reactions against the surveillance state against manipulation by the state and this is a very special German phenomenon which we can understand looking back into the history here's a first Godwin <laughs> so here's a ballot from Nazi times to choose whether Austria should join the German Reich, showing a big yes and a very small no circle. Um, the English term for this is libertarian paternalism which doesn't work so well in German. There are undertones in these German terms that are that, that include neoliberalism and state control. So something got lost in translation. In German this sounds like the people wanting to take away our stakes, our fun, our speeding. And liberal sounds like people wanting to take away money from small people. And the thought that this could be a good thing combined does not spring to mind. If you look at who's against nudging, there is also something to keep in mind for this discussion. It's Foucault against Latour. It never happened, this French duel. But Foucault is close to the things. We have to take them serious. Latour gave the nice example of the hotel key. May the force be with you. The force is flowing. The object is dissolving. We have the shift from the civil society to the controlled society. The control is getting internalized. Foucault was right, oh my God. Those two books are standing against each other. Sasha Lobo is not today here because he's still writing on the critique. You all will read the book and you all say it's so terrible. Who is against nudging as well? This is De Fabio. He is the new right-wing thinker. No matter what the government does, he's against it. They mustn't seduce. This is something for the advertising industry. The private sector has been doing this for 20 years. It's the nice design and advertising replaced by psychotechniques and manipulation. Well, the advertising seems to have copied it from Nazi theorists. In the 50s, it went on with deep psychologies like we do in, like we saw in Mad Men, the example of the psychologist there. How do we have to 
approach consumers. Today we scan brains, we have neuroscience to understand how the consumer is thinking. Many of those theories are very effective. We are actually being influenced by that. So new ideas of behavioral science are put to use in advertising. We have new ways of luring consumers, like this display in the entry zone of the supermarket. Your attitude for TV sets are being changed entirely by these decoys. We're going home with a huge TV set because we've lost all measure for TV sets. This is how they change menus in restaurants. They introduce menus that are too large to consume. But it's good value for money, so consumers buy it. Good value for money is hidden in the so-called Siberia dish. Nobody will ever find it. This is how it is done in restaurants to influence sale. It would be important to change this, to go back to a reasonable handling of things. Why do people act against their common sense? Procrastination is a result on short term we decide differently than we would on a long term basis Ekelhoff, the Nobel Prize winner, forgot his suitcase and he was decided to do that soon. He decided to do it tomorrow and then once again postponed it and do it one after day tomorrow. And at the end of it, he sent back his suitcase. At the end of his stay, this is the marshmallow test. Our very old thinking, a limbic system, tells you, well, eat this marshmallow now, you might run in front of a truck and never get this marshmallow. A four-year-old prefrontal cortex can't imagine a battle tomorrow and can't think, well, maybe you'll have two marshmallows if you can resist the temptation to eat it now. And this internal struggle is also behind the reluctancy to save money, to save up for a pension, and people will regret later that they haven't seen so far into the future and planned ahead. Aristotle has introduced the term akrasia for behavior that is against one's own best interests in the long run. There are four kinds of weakness associated with lust. 
acting too fast because of lust and the same things based on anger. Sansin and Thaler want to build decision hierarchies in such a way that people should be seduced to behave in a way that will make them better off in the end, as judged by themselves. This is what we have to take home from here, and this is the red line around what nudging me can do. So, how can we get people not to use their freedom of will against their own interest? And a nice way to do this is the default setting. So, what's the default given in situation where choice is necessary. And this is done in a very nice way in Cologne. Your beer glass will always be full until you put the lid on top. You never have to decide, do I order another one? Because the glass will always be refilled unless I put the lid on top. So this works nicely as an example for opt-out. Um, if you've ever tried to install an antivirus software, you know that you'll have an ask search bar or whatever in your system unless you've unchecked the box. But it can also be used to good purposes. This is the readiness of people to donate their organs in various European countries, and there is quite a large difference difference between the countries on the left and those on the right. And one has to wonder, is this caused by cultural differences? Are there such large cultural differences between Germany and Austria? Well, I really doubt that. But what's the difference? Well, in Austria you have to opt out to not be an organ donor, so by default you are an organ donor unless you opt out. In Germany you have to show interest, have to take action and fill in an organ donor pass. Now, well, you might think that maybe I do not want to do this, but you can always opt out again. Well, but the funny thing is that in Austria, maybe 0.02% really took the effort to opt out of it. So it doesn't seem to be about the choice, really. This is known on the internet as persuasive design. This is one more nudge. If you fly to your vacation, there are only two seats left on your plane, which you really have to buy now. It's about the arrangement of choices, and another field where this works quite well is the arrangement of forms. One has found that forms, which need to be signed right on top, will be filled in much more truthfully than forms which are signed at the end, because once you've signed it at the top, you feel bound to give a true account. And we'll hear about this tomorrow from Thomas Virus. Which is about quote, unfucking the social security process in Germany. And often it's quite a counterintuitive approach, whatever works. And that's where it gets close to design thinking. There are also nice nudges in Greece. The new government has introduced a nice little nudge in their new program, which was to introduce a lottery to receipts and invoices in Greece to get people to pay taxes. The fun thing is it works. You ask for a receipt, the vendor pays the taxes and you get a chance to join in a lottery. Cameron's glorious British nudging unit has introduced a lot of measures. One of them very notably is 
a program to get better insulation on attics. Those grants were not accepted by the populace. Increasing the grants did not help. And the real issue turned out to be that attics were quite messy, quite stuffed, and changing the grants to clearing up your attic turned out nicely in the end and worked. There's one field where we can probably all agree on that energy is quite effective and a good thing. It is people staying along, staying alive for a longer time, and if possible, not killing themselves. So if it's just a little nudge keeping people from killing themselves, you don't really have to ask yourself, was this ultimate measure a good thing? In Britain, it was found that a paracetamol killed a lot of people who committed suicide using it. So they stopped selling these bottles of paracetamol and repacked it into little blister packs, which forced people to push out each single tablet. People would have to, to, to take and kill themselves, and it really reduced suicide rates by 40%. Here's an example from Tokyo. It concerns drunk people getting home in the morning. It's, there are several hundred deaths of people standing up from the railway, stumbling ahead drunk and falling on the track. People just stumble drunken into the track and the solution was to just turn the seats by 90 degrees, which reduced the death rates by 90%. And this brings us to architecture, city planning and nudging is all about creating living spaces to get people to behave in a way that is good for the public interest. This was called social engineering in earlier times, which is quite a nasty term considering society as a machine. And nowadays you would call this social design. And we'll go into more depth here in the beginning of July in the Digital Bauhaus Summit in Weimar. The flyers are available near the entrance, but we have to get on here. We shortly found one term, neighborhood technologies, that's more suitable. It's a nice thought with which we would like to end. With which methods can you change neighborhoods so it's habitable? and so people act better than in the 70s. One example are the banlieues in Paris, where architecture looks more like setting it on fire than to live in it. In Holland, you will find new urbanism, a positive example. All the signs were removed, there were shared spaces installed. It works. In this sense, you can get a positive dynamics for society. A play. Genau, oder können wir nicht äh, Pfand sammeln und ihnen da entgegenkommen? Das ist For example, can we help homeless people to collect bottles in a dignified way? If you look at a me mechanism that fosters social behavior, you can do this, but this can be difficult if you 
get people to compete for social compatibleness? How can we become better people? We could, for example, take a self-made smoothie to a new colleague. Nobody wants to live like that. Robert Faller, a left-leaning intellectual from Austria, says we don't want to be so good. We want to be incorrect sometimes. We want to protest. We want to act like children. We want to be politically incorrect. Sometimes I think that it's not so bad. Pure rationalism may never conquer. Pure reason. Pure should never conquer? Is that true? What kind of a statement is that? Dialectics of enlightenment. We would rather live in a society where pure reason should rather conquer we would like to suggest that we should rethink nudging. <laughs> Maybe it's not so bad. There's one more thing. Please order Clocky on the Internet. It's on the Internet and you can also do financial transactions and you can order online smoothies. <laughs> Every time you hit the snooze button, Clocky will donate to an organization you cannot like at all. Maybe the Republicans, it could be one of the right-wing marches in Germany. And you won't believe how quickly you get out of bed. So follow us on Facebook. And we're on to the next talk. Thank you for listening. And if there's anything you'd like to tell us on the translation booth, oh. you can reach us at hashtag RP15EN. Thank you. Dum, 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 dum. Ah, jetzt. Bitte schneller Szenenwechsel hier. Der nächste Vortrag steht schon quasi in den Startlöchern. Ich sehe, es gibt eine Umwälzung. Ich hätte ja fast gedacht, es sei dieselbe Zielgruppe. Sucht, uns, sucht euch schnell einen Platz. The next talk will be translated from German and English. Um, there are headphones near the entry. Please pick one if you want the translation. Krass. Okay, alles klar? Wunderbar. Das waren die kleinen Anstöße. Die kleinen Anstöße für ein besseres Leben. Ihr werdet wahrscheinlich um, die Welt nicht mehr mit den selben Augen sehen. Ein Spezialist für diesen Perspektivwechsel, den gibt es jetzt. Lasst uns goldig sein. Lebens- und produktionstechnische Hinweise zur Bewegungsfigur in der kleinen und kleinsten Formen. Der kleinen und kleinsten Formen, die das Netz zum Schimmern bringen, zum güldenen Glitzern und zum Leuchten. 
präsentiert von Stefan Poromka, ähm, Professor für Texttheorie und Textgestaltung an der UDK hier in Berlin. Stefan, deine Show. Viel Spaß. Bin ich schon traurig. Am I on yet? Thank you for the invitation. I'm doing something that's almost seamless to the other talk. I'm talking about small things. Whatever you, whatever brought you here, I want to talk about cuteness. It's not kitsch. It's not about softness. It's not about sweetness or niceness. It's what I call cuteness, goldiness. I do something like I do in lectures at university. I bring some material. This is a current book you should read. If you want to read Adorno, you should start with his lectures. That is what is being said. This is really nice because he explains what and how you should think. I'm looking through it and I'm showing you a few bits and pieces of the text. I just want to little bit of my impressions that I had when I read it. You have someone in front of you who's really polite. He makes himself really small, not because he wants to dissolve, but in the sense that he is, uh, that he wants to remain on the same level as the things that he is dealing with. Thinking mustn't stop. It shouldn't. Should move on. It has to be able to be corrected through the thing. All truth is preliminary. It's always only said through preliminary thinking. This is something that you find in all his lectures. You have to deal with all that is being said. In all you do, you always have to think of all the preliminary lists. You have to keep that in mind. This moment of contradictory is there, and it's always always making it so productive to keep on thinking, and you can develop a method out of it. Not because because you want to dissolve in it, but before you, but because you want to continue thinking. Look at this passage from the text. Here you can see the small sign, which is golden. I make small signs of goldiness. Sometimes it's a little more. Sometimes it's full of it because I'm so enthusiastic with it. Sometimes it's always also on the cover. Sometimes I take my books and I can say they are goldy, golden. I'm recommending it. If you want to read something special, read the read the letters that Robert Walzer signed with little Robert or little Walzer. When he was writing, he was almost he was continually writing smaller and smaller until it's really, really cute and small. Franz Kafka's diaries is also very 
einfach nur kleine Stücke. Golden. Einfach zu etwas Größerem fügen, ohne aber die Behauptung zu machen, dass sie eine große Erzählung sein, die den Leser. They don't attempt to say that they are a big story, a big storyline. Gute Tweets finde, notiere ich, mache ich so ein Zeichen auf dem Handy. Sind schon, das ist Holm Friebe. Ne? Das ist Holm Friebe. He, he has been turned into gold by me. It's a very hesitant, careful thinking. A book, Granular Society, which is describing that things are getting smaller and smaller. It also has to do something with nudges. This is my form of street art. I turn things golden. Here you see my little golden spots. Humans can become golden. Sometimes I do it in secret. You can see that this is what you see has a bigger purpose. I am looking for things who are golden. Let me go back to the moment to the idea that I explained with Adorno. It has nothing to do with Kitsch. So, the figure of thought in the small, the, the, the moment of taking yourself back, is a way of recalling the situation. And this is something that, for me, the, 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 goldish, the goldenness, the, the cuteness, uh, this is the ring that you give out. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a golden tribute, or it's a, also a symbol. Uh, a connection, and this is the most valuable thing that you can give someone a golden ring, maybe, but at the same time, it's a very devalued uh, gesture. So, how, how is it possible that this is, a, this is the sort of inter, uh, the, the interplay between the, the, the worthlessness and the value of this gesture is, is interesting to me? Um, so, I think in this, in this space in between. Um, this is something my daughter made. Well, I think there's a lot to be seen in the, in the space between the smallness and the, the larger thoughts. So this is a, a cute, a goldish, a gold, goldy gesture, uh, something my daughter made. I'm just holding this, and this is a symbolic expression, which is obviously um, yeah, representing something, something of a larger magnitude, my, um, the feelings for my daughter. But, uh, Illustrated in a very, even a very reduced uh, gesture. So this is a, a sort of slate of hand or an, uh, a simplified way of, of maybe, yeah, addressing these these larger issues with a, with a, with a in a smaller manner. So what is this goldiness I'm, I'm, I'm speaking about? So it is something that is factually. Uh, small, but has the potential to, to be scaled up, so it has a wider range potentially. So, but currently, um, if you are given something uh, in the form of these one of these small gestures, this is, you don't want guilt to be heaped upon you. You don't want uh, any kind of strings attached. Um, so, the, the, it needs to be a very sort of minimal gesture. That's the cuteness, uh, the the possibility, um, and the, the 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 range of options that you have uh, are, are are enhanced. So, uh, take for instance. Uh, Romantic communication. This is this is ba based on the principle of of sending small, giving small messages, uh, sending small gestures. And so, the gesture itself um, obviously transports something which has a much la wi wider range. And I think in the in the communication itself, there is a kind of 
ambiguity between that which you do and that which the, the sort of larger, the, the broader potential. So, not not the, 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 the huge promise for life, or uh, but it, it can just be a, the small gesture, maybe representing the, 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 the big gesture. So, friendship, on the other hand, um, the photo here, this is like a, a memorabilia or souvenir box. I think in the 70s we all had this kind of thing. This is interesting now in the sort of digitalized world, um, how we made these, these, these documents at the time. We made kind of letters and went into copy shops to, to literally craft, craft letters and messages for ourselves. And this was something we, are, we sent to others. This is the basic form of the, the letter to a friend is, or maybe even a, 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 a little gift. You, you see something at the, on the flea market and you say, oh, I'll, I'll take it along, I'll bring it for my friend. So attention. Um, so this is a kind of gesture of caring, maybe, a specific kind of communication. And I would even claim that um, these communications are all universally made cuter, made more goldy, as I, as I term it. So we had to have a kind of go goldiness communication. And I think uh, this goldiness, or making the communication more goldy, uh, this is especially pertinent in the, in the net uh, communication context. I think this is universal, uh, universally the case in on the internet. So this is a kind of inflation of cute communication, making making objects, transforming them, forwarding a message, a gesture of love. So this is something uh, universal, obviously. Obviously, the, 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 the social media are strongly based on this. And so we can either, on, on the social media scale, obviously we can address people immediately. We can approach them as, as a person, as an online persona, and just find these small points of communication. So take uh, Elo, the app, as an example. It was, it was just cute. It was, yeah, goldy. Um, this is a new a new country is being discovered and that sort of very, very um, archaic gesture of, of, of exchange and giving and sharing, um, that's not to, to, to undermine that, that gesture, but just to give it a kind of different trajectory or context in this kind of network setting. So uh, this was what I found interesting about ELO, or in the in, or more general network communication setting. Goldenness is everywhere where you share something, where you can continue change and expand things. That's the basic principle. It's a complex process, and that's the difference. This kind of communication has been there since the 19th century. You can find it. 1980 as well with with a bricolage in the 1980s but something new happens we now have the possibilities to have this in a network we have the opportunity to look at small things and to look at what small things do in that context they don't stay with one person they start things we are absolutely fascinated by this, and what can we do with this? I think and that's my my sentiment how do i How do I deal with Instagram? Golden It has this moment of cuteness of goldenness. It's the most golden from all the social web tools that I know. 
You don't have to comment it, you open your album, you show what you want to show, but you don't have to follow it, you don't have to comment. And you're learning a lot about photography and you're learning a lot about aesthetics just by other people are showing it. This is Ute Vogel, Frau Vogel. I'm just sewing this because they always say there are so many food bloggers, pictures of food. She, she has done this and, and I think the bread is wonderful, it's beautiful. It's so easy, it's so, so simple, it's a golden gesture. I don't have to, to do much with it, it's just an offer. It's, it's like with uh, an artwork by Van Gogh. You can, it, it doesn't have a deeper meaning, but she does it. There is a basic irony in this, and this basic irony connects with all that she has done before. She's not only posting breads and sandwiches, she's also social media advisor in the cultural sector, and she's very, very active. And I see that the bread is playing a role in this network of what she's doing. And all the people on Instagram, they give me gifts every day without asking. They show small, small parts of their life. But through her comments and her chronology, they get something special. And I feel I can enter a story or a project without being pushed on me. I can think about it. And I can think about what this has to do with digital culture. And someone who reminds us um, on the connection between the internet and Adorno is Nine Quarterly. He has a basic elementary goldenness. He gives us so many things. And he's offering us small things, small nudges is offered, are offered for, from him. What am I doing? I'm showing contradictions. I, I show small enigmatic riddles, small thoughts that are not like easy to, to answer, but they contain some irony, a kind of joke. This you will see in, on stage four tonight at eight o'clock. This is a technical diary by Katrin Passig. And many people are writing on this diary. But they don't get any money from it. They just contribute that voluntarily small segments that you can, can, can continue working with it. So Berlin und 2000 schreiben werden. Dann werden wir natürlich was über die Riesenmaschine schreiben und dann werden wir auch was über die zentrale Intelligenzagentur schreiben. Und es werden wir werden es als Jahre der Goldigkeit bezeichnen. We will write about a lot of things like the big machine or the central intelligence. And we will read this in the years to come. Here are four examples of four books, and I just took a big pen and uh, painted across all these books. And they are all interconnected. The authors are connected, the topics are connected. It's a productive line between them. The books are written, so they are interconnected. This is a very golden image, because it's like like a hobbit. From this perspective, it's clear 
um, why Holm Friebe is interested in nudges. He comes from a collective which doesn't less let disappear the individual. He says that you can enter a network without giving up your individualism. They can start inspiration and productivity and innovation. In this sense, so there is a moment of communication of goldenness, good nudges. What are good nudges? Golden nudges are always dialectic nudges, those who are not only manipulating, but they also deal with their contradictory elements and they leave room for the other to work with what he is reading. So the question is, of course, how do you how do you handle these these tiny nudges, the the granular little gestures, um, the ethics of of this atomized society or gran granular? Uh, obviously, I, I believe it follows. Uh, obviously, has to be an ethics of. Uh, goldiness of cuteness. So our fascination for the, the small things is on the productive side, one, um, uh, an opening, an uh, opportunity, um, uh, uh, an opportunity to think on, uh, to find further further thoughts uh, to attach to that. And this is, of, of course, something that, um, that Adorno uh, fulfills. Uh, Absolutely, because he's he's uh, first and foremost interested in in the ethics of this of this of the small things. So even in production, even even if it's a small item that you produce and you feed into the system, like a tweet, like an Instagram photo, this element of the 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 goldiness, the the smallness and cuteness has to be ingrained or inscribed into the into the message itself. So. This means we have to determine how, how these things should be constructed so that they can contain this, this contradiction. We, they have to be revertible, there is, but there is no, no obligation. There is just an opportunity of action that ensues possibly. So if you're discussing the ethics of, this, of the, the, the small gesture, it will have to address this matter. It will have to address the question of everything, every tiny granular, every item you share or disseminate, this is obviously a small thing, but this necessarily needs to contain a larger gesture within. And this is kind of an expectation, sort of um, overproduction or overexpectation, but this should be obviously achieved in a way that is not difficult or for the for the, the sender of the message so it's important to remember the the, the possible fol uh, following com communications and think of of this well universal of this universal method of, of making things Goldier, making things smaller without actually simplifying them, oversimplifying. So these things will have to be, be, be carried by their own reducedness or by their own con contradictoriness. So um, this isn't about um, reducing or just focusing on, on smaller aspects. But if we want to pre um, prevent ourselves from thinking about these aspects, about, about kitsch, about smallness, about cuteness, about fluffiness. Um, so this is something which we have to think about the way how they can also reduce that at the same time. Thank you very much.